The opening months of the First World War shattered any misconceptions of a quick and clean war, both at the front and at home. A couple of weeks ago, we covered the naval bombardment of Great Yarmouth, a terrifying but ultimately ineffective gesture by the German Imperial Navy in the late months of 1914. It was not long until a far more daunting attack would hit this small seaside town, this time coming from the air, in an incident that would not only change the face of warfare, but would become to be seen as the new standard of total war. It was wet and foggy in the early hours of the 19th of January 1915 when two German Zeppelins took off from Futzbittel near Hamburg, Germany. Their targets were Hull and Humberside in northeast England with its valuable dockyards. They were joined by the L6 from Nordshold, tasked with bombing the Thames estuary as they set out over the North Sea. Things would start to go wrong for the raiding force. First, engine trouble would force one of their number, the L6, to abandon their mission and return to Germany. The remaining two Zeppelins, the L3 and the L4, soon found themselves blown off course by bad weather over the North Sea, forcing them to reroute south towards the coast of Norfolk. Closing in on the coast in front of them, they split up. The L4, commanded by Captain Lieutenant Count Mangus von Platten Hollemund, continued westward, heading towards Kings Lynn. The L3, commanded by Captain Lieutenant Johann Fritz, headed south for Great Yarmouth. Drawing close to Great Yarmouth, the L3's first action was to drop a number of parachute flares near the village of Haysborough and Winterton, dropping its first real bomb near the village of Olmsby, but doing no damage, before moving south towards Great Yarmouth, being guided in by the town's lights. By 8.30pm, they were now flying over the town. The L3 dropped up to 10 bombs onto the streets below. The exact number has been disputed for over a century now. But either way, Great Yarmouth now has the rather dubious honour of being the first town in Great Britain to be bombed from the air. The first bombs landed outside the town, doing no damage. But at least one bomb landed in the working class area of the town called St Peter's Plain, destroying the front of the building known as Peter's Villa, badly damaging the workshop the other side of the road and killed two residents. Samuel Smith, a 53-year-old shoemaker by trade who was walking down the road at the time of the bombing, and was killed instantly when the bomb landed next to him. The second victim was at number 22 St Peter's Plain, a 72-year-old spinster named Martha Taylor. Their both their death certificates would read, explosion due to bomb from hostile aircraft. They were the first British civilians to be killed in an air raid. These would be the only fatalities in Great Yarmouth, but two other civilians would be wounded in the bombing. Extensive damage was sustained to the surrounding area of St Peter's Plain, leading to several buildings having to be demolished. Windows were smashed, a water main was burst near Fish Wharf, and houses were damaged, leaving glass and debris littering the roads. Other bombs that fell failed to go off, made too fast by unskilled workers to keep up with demand, a problem that would plague all sides during the First World War. The final bomb dropped by the L3 landed near the town's racetrack, killing a dog. The raid on Great Yarmouth lasted little over 10 minutes before the L3 turned back east across the sea to return to Germany, its work done. To the north, the L4 began its raid, dropping its first bomb, an incendiary bomb, on the village of Sheringham that landed in Wyndham Street but failed to explode and was quickly put in a bucket of water by local residents. The bomb was often reported to be the first bomb to be dropped on Britain, but there is uncertainty due to the time it was dropped as the Yarmouth raid may have already been underway at the time. Before it moved away, the L4 dropped its second bomb, Although this one did explode, it caused no damage. Lost in the darkness, thinking they were hundreds of miles to the north, the L4 desperately looked for its target of Hull, circling until 9.50pm, when, in hopes of finding something, Hunderland ordered the L4 to be lowered. With the story going, they were in fact so low at one point, they almost crashed into the roof of the school at Thornham. Regaining altitude, they moved on, dropping a single bomb that landed near the church of Snettisham, smashing windows, and leaving those who had just left a meeting inside the building shaken but unharmed. Arriving over King Glynn at 10.50pm, although the commander had become so turned around by the cold and bad weather, he believed he was over Scarborough at the time. Town's chief constable ordered all lights to be turned off in hopes the Zeppelin would lose track of its intended target, but it was too late. Down the bombs came as they did in Yarmouth. Hitting Bentick Street, cutting two lives short, in what would be described as the effects of the acts of the king's enemies by the coroner. 26-year-old Alice Gazeli, who had recently been widowed when her husband Percy had been killed on the Western Front in the October 1914 while serving with the Rifle Brigade, and Percy Goat, who was 14 and sleeping at the time. His mother described the incident. We were all upstairs in bed when I heard a buzzing noise. My husband put the lamp on and I saw a bomb come through the skylight and strike the pillow where Percy was lying. 
I tried to wake him, but he was dead. Then the house fell in. I don't remember any more. Across the rest of the town, 13 people were injured. A row of terraced houses was destroyed and the town's clock was damaged. The bombing over, the L4 turned east and would follow the L3's path home, travelling over Great Yarmouth as it did. The raid would really hit home with the British people that were now in a very different type of war than the likes they had ever experienced before, where soldier and civilian would both be targets. The Germans had scored a vital morale victory that when taken into account with the recent naval raids along the coast led many to believe the next step was full-blown German invasion. The four killed were all civilians and their deaths helped play into the anti-German propaganda that was so prevalent at the time, with Zeppelin crews often being referred to as baby killers. But rather than some random attack by a monstrous enemy from across the sea, the raid was a retaliation attack for an unsuccessful British raid by the Royal Naval Air Service on Christmas Day 1914, aimed at destroying the German Zeppelin pens at Krugshaven. The attack, being the first of its kind in Britain, was studied with great curiosity by the press over the following days, with the Times having several articles covering the Zeppelin and its bombs. It was plain that the source of the disturbance was aircraft, although precisely what kind can only be conjectured. The opinion is generally held that it was a dirigible, for what appeared to be searchlights was seen at a great altitude. Others, however, say that the lights were not beams of searchlights, but flashes of something resembling a magnesium flare. The upper part, for all the world, like the cone to be found in every art classroom, is made of thin metal and packed with a resonant substance which, after experiment on a very small scale in an ordinary fire grate, I found to be highly inflammable. The damage caused by the raid would run to £7,000. £724,336.68 today when adjusted for inflation. Both Zeppelins that took part in the raid would have a short war. It would only be on the 17th of February, less than a month after the raid on Great Yarmouth, that the L3 and her crew would encounter engine trouble, forcing them to land in neutral Denmark, where the crew would be interred for the rest of the war, but not before they were to burn the L3 to stop her capture. Rather by coincidence, the L4 was retired from service on the same day the L3 was burnt. Three of the four killed are buried in the local cemeteries of the town they lived and died in. Percy Goat and Alice Gazeli are buried in Hardwick Road Cemetery, Kings Lynn, and Samuel Smith buried in Kitchener Road Old Cemetery, Great Yarmouth. Martha Taylor was taken and buried in Caister. The areas would of course be rebuilt, but the passing of time would have the area of Kings Lynn cleared for car parks and offices, leaving no trace of the original bomb site. The area in Great Yarmouth is marked with a blue plaque. The event of this cold winter's night are covered in the book Death from the Skies, the Zeppelin Raids over Norfolk, 19th of January 1915 by R.J. Watt. On the 100th anniversary of the bombings in 2015, commemorations were held in Great Yarmouth in Kings Lynn, as well as a smaller ceremony in Caister where Martha Taylor is buried. The Yarmouth one was centred both at Yarmouth Cemetery, where Samuel Smith is buried, and the site of the bombing itself. Among those in attendance was Smith's great-great-nephew, who was interviewed by the local paper, the Great Yarmouth Mercury. He was my nanny's uncle. She spoke very little about this period in her life. It was a sad time for her. We knew he died in an air raid, but we didn't realise the importance of the event. The fact that he, along with Martha Taylor, were the first victims of an air raid in mainland Britain. Today has been emotional. Although the event at the graveside was very fitting, and I think the service here was a wonderful surprise in actual fact. I'm very happy to be here and honoured to be part of the service. For both Britain and East Anglia, the war was far from over. Both would find themselves under attack from the air and the sea several more times before the final peace. This will be covered in the future. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Links to all the information and pictures used is in the description below. Please subscribe and like if you wish. This was Kings Lynn and Great Yarmouth, 19th of January 1915, a sad day of firsts, and this was a little bit of history.